الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا وعظيمنا وزعيمنا وحبيبنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين We have been talking about the relationship we should have with Allah in the context of having good manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today we are delving into the package of rights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed on every human being. There is a package in the Quran that exceeds what we know of the international human rights covenant or anything else that man could ever come up with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave humanity a package of rights that is full of dignity, full of freedoms, full of respect, and full of all what pleases and satisfies the human needs. And the ultimate purpose is to convince us that everything is in his hand but also to convince us to interact with Allah with good manners, with etiquette, with respect, and with appreciation. The package starts off with the right of every human being to live. Allah created us and he gave nobody the right to kill nobody except in due process of law. Law means Islamic law. Haq al the right to life, is a right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives extreme attention and there is a lot of texts in the Quran that address that right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا Kill not each other for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been merciful to you and is always merciful to you. So killing is prohibited and maybe all of us would say that is true in all other religions anyway. But in Islam there is something a bit different, a big difference. That is you are not allowed to kill a person based on their belief based on their uh, opinion, based on their freedom that Allah has given them to choose right and wrong, so long as the exercise of those freedoms does not transgress on the rights of others in the society. Let's take for example the right to own a land, the right to possess and buy and sell it's a human right, it's a basic right. But then that right can be taken away if the state has decided that the only way to build uh, an important institution or a highway or something, <coughs> excuse me, is by taking that piece of land. But even then, that piece of land has, the owner of that piece of land has to be compensated according to the market price. And he has to be compensated well. And he has to be given a choice to buy a similar piece of land in a similar attractive position or location. So we have to be careful that we take those rights to heart and whatever Allah gives us of right, that we do not abuse it. What if somebody took the life of somebody wrongfully? then the Quran says you have one of two things, either retribution, which is qasas, or that 
if the family of the deceased, the killed, agrees to take a compensation and they agree to forgive the right to retribution, then you must pay them the retribution that you agreed to. This is something uh, quite unique to Islamic law. In many nations, they do not give the deceased or his family, of course, the right to give away the killing of the killer. And sometimes states have the right to do that based on their appreciation of the consequences and the repercussions. So Islam gives you the two choices, either retribution to kill the killer or compensation, which is to pay expiation or fidya to the family based on the appreciation of both the family and the state as to which is better for the society's safety. And that's why Islam gives choices. When Allah gives choices, it is not to abuse them and use them uh, exchangeably, just at random, but to look at the best interest. The purpose of retribution is to protect more lives from being wasted. The purpose is not revenge. Otherwise, it used to be that families revenged against each other when a member of this family is killed by a member of this family. People used to exercise, uh, exercise revenge as a way of retribution. But Allah says, no revenge. وَمَنْ قُتِلَ مَظْلُومًا فَقَدْ جَعَلْنَا لِوَلِيِّهِ سُلْطَانًا فَلَا يُسْرِفْ فِي الْقَتْلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ مَنْصُورًا Anyone who's killed uh, by transgression, no fault of his own, and no aggression on his part, then his family has the right to seek retribution, but they have to seek it through the authority. فَقَدْ جَعَلْنَا لِوَلِيِّهِ سُلْطَانًا وَلِيِّ الدَّمْ The survival, the surviving members of the family of the deceased, they have the right to seek retribution through the system, through the uh, judicial system in the nation in which they live. So this is the right of uh, a believer uh, in Islam for his life to be protected. And the two conditions that are set so that no life is wasted and the line is drawn as to under what condition a person is permitted to commit acts of killing or fighting are set in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ And fight in the path of Allah only those who fight you. In fact, if you read the text with meaning, it should be, and fight back only against those who fight you. Because fighting against those who fight you only means that you are always going to be fighting back, which means never initiate aggression. Never initiate aggression. And the rest of the ayah says, وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا Never commit aggression. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ Allah loves not those who commit aggression. But also, there is a, a bigger reason as to what may allow a nation to engage in a fight with another nation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا لَكُمْ لَا تُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْمُسْتَضْعَفِينَ من الرجال والنساء والولدان الذين يقولون ربنا أخرجنا من هذه القرية الظالم أهلها واجعل لنا من لدنك وليا واجعل لنا من لدنك نصيرا The translation is And why don't you fight in the path of Allah which means according to the guidance of Allah which means only by the permission of his reasoning, not our reasoning. For the purpose that he sets forth, not the purpose that we set ourselves. So, and why don't you fight in the path of Allah and for the sake of helpless men, women, and children who are screaming to Allah, asking for relief and help. Oh Allah, 
give us a way out of this oppressive village or town or city or nation. أَخْرِجْنَا مِنْ هَذِهِ الْقَرْيَةِ الظَّالِمِ أَهْلُهَا Whose people are oppressive. They watch no justice, they observe no limits, and this is actually happening in many places in the world where you have either a local regime that is oppressing its people, like the regime of Pharaoh in the old days, or the regime of Assad, or the regime of Myanmar, or the regime of Sisi in Egypt. All of those types of regimes that are killing at whim whoever opposes them, those regimes, the people under those regimes are equally screaming the same way the ayah is talking about helpless men, women, and children. And those regimes have not observed neither age, young or old, nor health, good or bad, nor age, nothing. They just went after what they regard as their enemies. In many cases, a simple signal, like the Rab'a signal, causes a child his life. It can cost any human being in Egypt his life. And now, unfortunately, Saudi Arabia is jumping on the bandwagon, issuing a decree, a royal decree, that anyone who supports the Ikhwan Muslimin, who have been declared as a terrorist organization, I would claim falsely, in Egypt, anyone who supports them, even by any symbolic gesture, will be subject to jail between 3 and 30 years. This is oppressive. This is as oppressive as it can be. As if those regimes are telling us plainly and clearly that we will do what we want, not because it is the right thing to do, not because it impacts our security, not because it's helpful to our people, but because we can. And this is exactly what Pharaoh used to say. Pharaoh used to say, اقتلوا أبناء الذين آمنوا معه واستحيوا نساءهم وإنا فوقهم قاهرون We are over them, we have the means to do anything we want, and we are going to do it. This is abuse of authority, abuse of power, and when helpless people, like the people in Syria now in particular, or people in Palestine in particular, who are screaming for outside help, it behooves every Muslim everywhere to lend what they can of help to give them the medicine they need, the food they need, the money they need, so that they can survive, let alone defend their right to exist and to have a safe life, to have a safe passage to their children's schools, to have a safe existence in their neighborhood so that others would not come supported by the, the regime or the occupying force to kill at whim. Uh, so the Quran says no. In a case like this, it becomes incumbent on the nearest neighbor of these people to offer all the help they can. So if they can stop aggression, they should. If they can offer relief materials, they should. If they can offer money, they should. So as Muslims, as people of conscience, we should never be intimidated by media campaigns or counter campaigns of the enemies of Allah that they intimidate us from standing up and speaking up about those issues. Yes, Islam is a religion of peace. But it is not a religion that wants to cut a Muslim into pieces for the sake of peace. A Muslim, like every human being, has the right to safe life and safe conditions for his life, for the safety of his family, for the security of his nation. And that right is only going to be defended by you standing up. As you stand up in defense of any nation in which you live, you should also stand up in defense of any nation that is subject to aggress aggression and manipulation and oppression. It is also our right as a human race that we all stand together. One more point to mention on this subject. As we mentioned before, 
the Quran does not allow or permit a Muslim to fight anyone just because they believe differently. In fact, it prohibits even trying to persuade somebody and convert him despite his clutching to his faith. If anybody is holding on to his faith, we should support them to make the choice that they have. But at the same time, we should never allow anyone to manipulate weak and helpless, needy Muslim communities by giving them some food, some water, and then some religious conversion instructions. That also needs to stop. Islam, in fact, while it prohibits us from fighting anyone just because of their faith, it leaves only one thing, that the only reason a Muslim should fight is to fight against aggression, against oppression, against those who attack our human rights as people, as humans in general. And we should always do this even if the victim is a Muslim or non-Muslim. And we should do it again as a perpetrator, whether the perpetrator is a Muslim or non-Muslim. That is the law in the Quran. And that's why you read in the Quran, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Muslim nations or Muslim communities fighting each other. And Allah commands the Muslims to fight back against the aggressor among the two. So the Quran says, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا بِالْعَدْلِ وَأَقْسِطُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُقْسِطِينَ If two groups or two communities of Muslims or believers fight against each other, reconcile between them based on justice and fairness. فَإِن بَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى If one of them then aggresses against the other, then fight against the aggressor. So the reason for fighting definitely is not their faith because both of them are believers. But the reason here is aggression. And the reason always in Islam will continue to be forever that a Muslim is never allowed to fight by initiating fighting, but to fight against attacks, aggression, oppression, manipulation, or abuse and violation of human rights. So when we stand to defend men and women and children who are helpless and asking Allah for help, we also have to remember that Allah instructed us to be his tool, to act his will in the real world. And as I always say, if it were the other way around in Palestine, that the Muslims are the ones oppressing the helpless men and women and children of the Israeli community or the Jewish community, then it would have been the responsibility of neighboring Muslims to rush to help those helpless Jewish members of the Jewish community because Islam is a religion of justice, not a religion of land grab or power grab or controlling others, or expansionism. Islam is a religion of justice. Islam went into East and West, but never expelled any community who lived in those places. Ones who changed to Islam, they are left alone. Ones who did not change to Islam, they are left alone. This is true in the East, in India and subcontinent, and it's true in the West, from Egypt to West. We still have a Christian community in Egypt that is quite strong and vibrant, that it wants to manipulate their power against the larger majority of Muslims. But that's okay. They have the right to seek to be in power. That is their citizenship right, and nobody should cry foul about this. But when they conspire with outside forces, then that becomes a problem of treason and injustice. So brothers and sisters, we have to be clear in our heart and head that we as Muslims do not commit to either nationalism, communism, capitalism, or anyism. We are only committed to Allah as the source of our life and the protector of our existence and the provider for our needs. This is the only commitment we have. Wherever Allah loves us to be, we will be.
And as such, Allah gave us next to the right to life, the right to live where you want. The right to live where you see your interest is without aggression against others and without violating the laws set by others. A Muslim, like every human being, they have the right to be anywhere they see their interest. And as such, the freedom to travel. The Quran says, فَمْشُوا فِي مَنَاكِبِهَا Walk on in its paths, the earth. هُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ ذَلُولَ فَمْشُوا فِي مَنَاكِبِهَا وَكُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِهِ وَإِلَيْهِ النُّشُورِ Allah provides for every human being wherever this human being goes. And your provision goes with you anywhere you go. You're not going to take somebody else's provision. We do have a problem in this nation, the problem that we all know about the immigration issue, that people who don't have enough means in neighboring southern countries like Mexico and Latin America, they seek to come and pick any job to provide for their families. They are not going to take a job from someone who's actually working. But they will offer the society here a lower paying labor that can be used for their benefit and for the benefit of lowering the cost of our economic products. And that is good for everybody. But some people are so paranoid that they want to deprive these communities from the right to roam the earth and seek their provision and earn good living for their families. Islam says nobody has the right to stop anyone from crossing any river, crossing any border, provided that he does not violate the basic laws of the country. So we need a legalized immigration and workforce that is approved by the nation's authority to allow cheaper labor to lower the cost of our produce so that we can become both a competitive nation but also a compassionate nation. One does not suffice for the other. It has to be a competitive nation in terms of products that are put out in the best of ways but at the least of prices, but also we have to have the compassion to help neighboring nations to learn from our technology and to learn from our ways and to learn from our system so that when they go back to the nations, they are going to become investors and they can develop their communities and they can have clean sewers, clean water, clean community, clean environment like we have. But if we live as a selfish nation, Islam says that is even against your own interest. So the payback is that the richest companies in our nation now are shipping the business from here over there. They are shifting manufacturing jobs to either Latin America, South America, or China and East Asia. Why? Because it's too expensive here. And we are, by maintaining that level of high expensive producers and products, we are also maintaining the inflation level of our dollar, both domestically and internationally. And that's why nobody is willing to buy what we produce when we export it because it's too expensive. So we are beaten by Japan, by China, by Europe, and by other industrial nations. So if we follow Islam, we will be a competitive nation and we will be a, com a compassionate nation at the same time. We will win and we will let others win. This is the justice that Allah is instructing us to, to be concerned about the well-being of our neighbors so that no neighbor is envious of their neighbor. No nation should border a nation that's living lavishly while they are living way under poverty conditions, way under safe life conditions, way beyond what is called safe water for drinking, uh, appropriate sewer system, appropriate transportation system, even cleaning uh, machines are not available for many of our southern neighbors. So we have to go back to Allah to ask Him what is just and what is fair and to live by this. And if we don't, then we have lost our good manners with Allah.
we have lost our respect of our Creator by discounting His instructions and by living a selfish life, a life of only self-preservation, even if it means the killing of others. Also, as part of our uh, human rights that Allah has given us, is the right to our dignity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have honored the children of Adam. وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ And we've carried them over both on earth and on the sea. And maybe someone would say, what about, what about flying? Well, the sphere around the earth is considered part of the earth because it's subject to the gravity, subject to laws of the earth as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying basically that he has given certain dignity for every human being. Now we see people who have, who have been killed alive in front of their own children or children in front of their own parents. How so? How could we consider this to be something we can stay silent on? How couldn't we start speaking and screaming loudly, as loud as we can, to make those issues alive issues? Because my dignity is part of your dignity. If I don't respect you, I don't respect myself. If I don't secure your dignity, I am violating my own. I am exposing my own dignity to the same abuse. So brothers and sisters, Allah gave every human being the right to his or her own dignity, which means you have the right not to be violated. You have the right that a policeman or a government officer should never violate your dignity, should never violate your honor, should never violate your privacy. But unfortunately, when our own government violates all of the above, we are killing American citizens by drone just because they are on another land. That is immoral, that is unacceptable, and that's not part of human dignity. That doesn't show respect for our laws or the laws of humanity in general. This is unacceptable. We are also doing a lot of things that are counter human dignity when we do not support when we support people with enough money to keep their dignity. Don't, then the rich amongst us should get together and form organizations and charities that can help fill the gap. Because it is the dignity of my neighbor. It is not good that you ride the best of cars, live in the largest of mansions, and then leave your neighbor to eat from the trash or to go homeless, or a woman with three kids because she is divorced, that she has to be homeless. No dignity, no respect, no privacy. When our government pries on our privacy by surveillance of both phone calls, text messages, and every motion that you have, that violates our dignity. It violates our human right for privacy. That is not anymore a national right or a gift from a government to people. This country fought for its dignity and the dignity of its citizens and the dignity of every human being that lives here. It is on us to push back against government intrusion in our private life, to push back to protect our dignity and to protect our privacy. The rights list is much longer than we can cover it. In, in, in a one day sermon. But let me tell you this, the ultimate purpose that Allah wants to secure and is actually giving us the license to protect all of the rights he has given us is for us as humans, not only Muslims, for every human being to feel that he or she are totally free to make a choice of their faith, a choice of their worship system, a choice of their worship place, a choice of what to do for business, so long as it does not violate the rules of Allah Brothers and sisters, 
as we remember these rights and unfortunately all humans in our days are more focused on rights more than responsibilities we need to remember our responsibilities towards Allah وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ And some people have not appreciated Allah the way He ought to be appreciated. We the Muslims, we the community of believers, should always be the first community to exhibit the utmost respect for all the rights that Allah has given to any and every human being. Otherwise, when we let those rights be violated for others, we are allowing our rights to be violated without anybody intervening on our behalf. May Allah guide us to protect our rights and the rights of everybody else. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحابته ومن اتبع سنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Brothers and sisters We need to remember that everyone around us has a right in everything we have the Prophet ﷺ said, من كان عنده فضل مال فليعد به على من لا مال له Anyone who has extra money, let him take it and reach out to those who don't have. Anyone who has extra ride, reach out and give it to the one who doesn't have a ride. Even if you take him with you in your car, that is his or her right that you give them a lift when they need it. من كان عنده فضل ظهر فليعد به على من لا ظهر له ومن كان عنده any type of extra anything let him give it to anyone who needs it the companion narrating the statement of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم kept giving examples of what a man may ever have until we became convinced that no one, no human being, has the right to anything that he doesn't need immediately. If you have anything that you do not need, clothing, money, food, ride, anything, the companion says, that is not your right. Whatever is extra is not yours. Which means all what we have been saying all along, that Allah provides for you. But through you, he provides for others around you. Those others may be relatives, may be parents, may be children, may be brothers, may be sisters, may be just neighbors, may be friends in the world, may be people you do not know, but you meet them in the street. But you know that they need. You know that they need. And they don't even ask. Many people need, but they don't ask. And many people ask, when they don't actually need. So you have to look for those that you know they actually need and give them the right. And when the Prophet ﷺ classifies this as their right, he is saying something important. Do not do any man. Don't make it like a favor. You're not doing anybody a favor but yourself when you give. The only one who is receiving your favor is yourself. قَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ صَدَقَةٍ يَتْبَعُهَا أَذَى To say something good and to forgive is much better than giving a charity that is followed by playing your favor on the person. That is much better. So Allah doesn't speak to us for us to just read the words or get what you call blessings from reading but the blessing actually comes when you understand and apply what you read that is the blessing of the Quran the blessing of the Quran is not to feel blessed 
after you read a chapter or more or less. The blessing is to transform your life based on what you read, based on what you understand. That is where your life becomes blessed by the Quran, when the Quran shapes your life. And that's why when Aisha, the wife of the Prophet وسلم, was asked, how was the manner of the Prophet وسلم, And she said, his manner was nothing different, nothing more, and nothing less than the Quran. His manner was the Quran. So he applied what he received of revelation in his life, and that was the blessings of the Quran on his life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our life with all what he has taught us. اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة